Hello everybody, this is the second part of our Alexander the Great episode. If you guys have not seen the first part, there will be a link in the description below. The Siege of Tyre happened, uh, I think, first, right? Before the Siege correct. of Gaza. Yes, correct. Um, they're very close to each other. So uh, the Siege of Tyre, I think, was a much more successful siege compared to when he sieged Gaza. Correct. Um, the same Gaza of today. Uh, but what happens in the Siege of Tyre specifically? So the Siege of Tyre is a very, very difficult city to besiege because it was off the coast of Gaza. So it was basically, when you're in this situation, Alexander has to be able to build some sort of connecting bridge, I guess if you would, mm -hmm. to be able to get his siege weapons to attack the, the actual city. And this was very difficult. Alexander struggled, he struggled tremendously with that because it's very difficult to attack a, a city when it's off the coast, when it's off, when it's out in the water. It's very difficult. Yeah. So he eventually built a bridge where wide enough and deep enough to where he could get his siege engineers in there. It's not the details of the battle are kind of skewed. There's many different accounts, but after several days of you know trial and error, he eventually broke in to Tyre and then eventually just wreaked havoc through there, just killing many of the people. He spared some of the people that uh, re that stayed in within like religious temple. He spared some of those people, but. He was very, it was a very hard fought battle. I mean, it's super, and sieges naturally are very difficult to conduct because it requires so much manpower, supplies. It's very, very difficult. And especially, and tires is, you know, no exception in that respect. It was very difficult. Yeah. Especially with the weaponry they had back then. Yeah. Right. Imagine trying to break walls with extremely primitive weapons. And trying to do it off the water too. Yeah. Which is, makes things 10 times harder. It's extremely difficult. Yeah. And um, right after that, he gets to Gaza. Right, he yeah. sieges Gaza right after he sieges Tyre, and the reason, by the way, the reason why he's doing this, I believe, was because he was trying to find a pathway directly to Egypt. Correct. Right? And uh, these garrisons are the path there. There's nothing stopping him from advancing his conquest once he gets through Tyre and Gaza. Gaza was a little bit more difficult because uh, it was believed that he had three unsuccessful uh, sieges, and then the fourth he finally got through. Yeah, Gaza was very difficult for him because, one, he had to wait for all the uh, siege machines that he used on Tyre mm -hmm. to come to Gaza. He was waiting on those, so he's over here waging. And that was that was not a very smart move on his part. It was better for him to have waited for everything to arrive all at once. So he once he besieges Gaza, there's a, there's a weakness in the south wall. So now, and what he does is... He, has, he can't really do anything yet because he has to wait for the siege weapons from Tyre to come in. He has, they haven't arrived yet. So once after finally a very gruesome, you know, horrifying, diff, horrifyingly difficult battle, the siege weapons arrive. Then they start breaking down some of the walls of Gaza, and then they finally get their win. Yeah, and uh, the man, the the commander of the garrison, was his name was Betis, right? right? The commander of the garrison in Gaza. And he fought, not only him, but even his men fought to pretty much the very end. Like, they did not give up. They did not try to uh, surrender, you know, without putting up a fight. And Batis specifically, after he was defeated, he refused to bow to Alexander. So Alexander wanted him to bow to him, right? Get kneel for him. And he refused. And this really showed the, the cruelness of Alexander the Great. And uh, it ties back to the whole Aristotle teachings about Achilles. Remember that. So what he does to Batis is he ropes or puts a rope through his Achilles right through his legs, ties him to a chariot, and drags him on the ground, the pavement, the gravel, everything there, just dragging him around and ultimately killing him through that kind of torture, right? Can you imagine just the, the, the amount of torture that must, because the, the, the death is not quick. It's slow. It's oh, not, it's horrible. It's not a quick death. I mean, your, it's very painful. Your head is bouncing off the pavement and you're getting rocks drugged. and oh my. The God. horses are pulling you by chariot and he got this idea. The, the reason why Alexander did this was because he, he got the idea from the Achilles story. Achilles did the same thing against this man named Hector, or Hector, sorry. He killed Hector in battle, and he didn't do this when Hector was alive. After he killed Hector, then he drug his body, uh, dragged his body by a uh, chariot. Same yes. way, but Alexander did it to Batis when Batis was alive. Another interesting fact about that battle is there was an Arab mercenary who had who had tried to deceive Alexander into believing that he betrayed Batis yeah. during the battle of during the siege of Gaza and he sh struck at Alexander but he didn't obviously didn't deliver a fatal blow yeah Alexander's men had instantly killed the Arab mercenary 
Yeah, and it just goes to show you, like these guys uh, in the garrison over there, they were it, it, like extremely uh, like determined to win this battle. Oh, like, of course, with any means, right? Deceiving Alexander, you know, pretending I'm going to be on your side, fighting him head on, whatever he, had, whatever they had to do, they would never surrender to him. The morale was very high on their side for sure. And he wanted, to, and what he did to Batis was not the only example. What he did afterward was was worse. So after he does this to Batis. He orders the execution of every single man in Gaza. He killed the whole male population in Gaza. That's insane. I mean, and and that's the tactic behind that is it's it's simply to eat, kill the power, kill all the strength within a society or a, or a city or where whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. And once you kill the the all the males, basically. It's easy to take care of the rest. You sweep yeah. up and enslave the women and the children. And that's exactly what happened. He enslaved, after killing all the men, he enslaved all the women and children in Gaza. Correct. And it, it sets an example to anybody, you know, surrounding uh, that place. And he has a wide open, uh, wide open path to Egypt at this point. After the siege of Gaza, what did he do right after this? He just prepares himself to head out to Egypt to, uh, to take over Egypt because obviously that's... Is that where he... You know, founds uh, founds Alexandria. That's where he founds Alexandria, and he uh, obviously he goes to many oracles, you know, religious centers yes, there, yeah. and performs divination, of course. Yeah, and by the way, Alexander like founded many cities, like he <laughs> and he named many of them. Uh, apparently, he ma- he named many of them Alexandria, not just the one in Egypt, but the one in Egypt is the one that you know obviously stood the longest. Correct, e- Egypt. Yeah, the one in Egypt is the most famed one. The most, yes, and this is right after the siege of Gaza, where he's like roughly like twenty four, twenty five years old. Correct, which yeah, is he's crazy. Very young, very young to be still doing very this. young, right? And he's succeeding in all of this, and he, he's showing the cruelness to his nature, the more emotional side to him, you know. And you start to see more of that ego come out. This man doesn't bow to me. I'm going to do this to him. Correct. Right? I'm going to, and then after I'm going to kill all the male population, and then after that I'm going to enslave all the women and children. Right. Correct. It's it's completely a different. I mean, he did it with the, in the Balkans as well. But like you're seeing this this bigger ego coming out of Alexander uh, on a much more massive Alexander scale. at this point. Yeah, at a much bigger scale. After this, I believe we go to the Battle of Gagamella, or something happened right before that. No, yeah, it's the Gagamella now. For okay. Me. So the Battle of Gagamella again against Darius the Third. So the interesting thing about Gagamella now, now Darius believes this is his mentality. Darius believes, okay, 110,000 guys didn't work. Fine, let's go to 200,000. <laughs> so he brings an enormous army. At least most, there's a lot of accounts that say 200,000, give or take. Yeah, yeah. So the estimates are going to be different. Either way, the Alexander's far, far outnumbered. Yeah. And Darius brings in the Persian immortals. Correct. The Persian Immortals make an appearance in this battle. And who, this is like their special unit, right? Yeah, the Persian Immortals are basically the special forces of the Persian army. These guys, they're called the Immortals because as soon as one was killed, one that one that was killed is immediately replaced by another. And almost seeming like as if they wasn't even killed in the first place. So that's why they basically called... These war Immortals were the famed Immortals who took down the so-called 300, 300 Spartans, Spartans yeah. and the other Athenians at Thermopylae. Yeah. Same, yeah, the same, essentially the same unit. Yes, these were the same, this is the same unit. Yeah, and what's the tactics here with Gagamela? Because at this point, this is a much larger scale battle with Darius III, and he's present at the battle as well. Correct. He Now, Alexander, what he does with this battle, it's, Alexander is very famous for using the hammer and anvil. Basically, hit from the front, sweep in from the back. Yeah. That's basically what he has here, going on here. Uh, it's very difficult for, he tries to use Darius tries to use his chariots. Alexander knows how to get around all that. And he successfully gets around the chariots. And he basically redefines warfare during his time period, Alexander, because Alexander does not use chariots. And the Persians are still using it, as you can see, in this battle. And he gets around all that. And eventually, he sends his flanks to attack Darius' flanks. He beats off the right flank, of course, the companion cavalry, very powerful in, yeah. in its own respect. So all the phalangites in the center are attacking the Persian center, the massive Persian center. Sweeps around, hits from the back, hammer and anvil. Darius, Darius' army loses, I believe he loses between fifty to 65,000 troops. Yeah, I see different numbers too. Like It's very high. It's like, I, I even read as low as 47,000, which is still incredibly high. And apparently Alexander lost maybe 4,000. Like They're very, very small. Very small. And we're talking about like a huge amount of men compared to you know fighting against his. Right, a very large number. And what happens as a result of this battle, right after this battle, is... Well, Dar- da- yeah, Darius escapes, right? Darius escapes. Yeah. As a result of this battle, Darius is assassinated. Yeah, and 
Now that whole thing is kind of crazy. So what happens here is Darius escaped, right? Correct. And uh, Alexander goes to take over Babylon, Susa, then eventually he'll get to the capital of uh, Persepolis, right? Correct. Uh, Darius was backstabbed by his own people. So he goes to flee, right? And um, he was conspired against and arrested by this man named Bessus. Some will call him Bessus the Rebel because he actually was a rebel. And uh, there are other nobles that also conspired against Darius III. You know, Bessus was uh, eventually chased by Alexander after he arrested Darius III. So he has Darius with him. He's getting chased by Alexander's men. So what Bessus does is he kills Darius. He kills the king of Persia, the last king of the, you know, the last king of the, uh, of the empire. Correct. Right. Kills him and throws his body into the road so he can get away. Right. If he throws Darius' body into the road, obviously they're going to stop and, you know, see that the king is dead. Right. The enemy, the, the big, uh, enemy is dead on the road. Right. His body's right there. Correct. Right. And, um, you know, later Alexander find, uh, finds Darius' body and buries it in a royal crypt at the capital of Persia. Right. Showing his respect in a sense. You know, he fought against this guy many times at this point. Right. He understands the, the, I guess in a way, like the fearlessness of Darius of you know, confronting Alexander the way he did, you know, even bringing 200,000 men apparently, you know, to fight Alexander the Great. When you fight someone uh, this many times on such large scales, you grow a bit of respect for them. Correct. Right. So he, you know, buries him in royal crypt at the capital of Persia in some sort of respect. Darius's death led Alexander to hunt down Bessus. So this act, in a way, you can say angered. You know, you can see it in a way like angered Alexander or at least made him determined enough to actually hunt down this man for many different reasons. Not just for the fact that, you know, he killed Darius III. You know, he betrayed him in a cowardly act. But also Bessus is now walking around saying, I'm the king. Right. right? I'm the new king of kings. I'm the new king of the Persian Empire. Uh, He self-proclaimed it because he was never officially designated as king of persia correct he never went through the i don't think there was anybody right nobody after darius iii was named like officially the king of persia except alexander maybe correct yeah there was no official ornation done for a king yes so at this time both alexander and bassus are proclaiming themselves as the new rulers of the persian empire which is pretty funny right yes alexander defeated darius but darius was killed by bassus right not in battle but captured so what happens throughout all this is Bessus' empire is kind of collapsing from within and out. Uh, he doesn't really know how to hold this uh, empire. He doesn't really know how to control the people. He's very new to this. And he was thinking about, you know, like defending a city of Bactria against Alexander, but he fled as his men were escaping, dying from battle, defecting to Alexander. There was a lot of people that defected Alexander from Persia um, because Alexander was gaining that reputation of being sovereign to the enemy, Right. He was like sovereign kind of in his rule, allowing the defective, uh, defected enemies uh, to even take their previous governing positions back. If they under him, though, you know, right. if they're under Alexander, they'll keep their position. They'll still be governor. They'll still be this politician, but it'll be under his rule. So it's a lot better than being killed off. Right. Correct. Um, so what happened was Bessus' people saw Bessus now as a threat to the sovereign treatment from Alexander. They were like, okay, Alexander wants this man, right? He's running away. He's fleeing. He's always on the run. And we know where he is, right? He's, he's our guy. He's kind of our leader. You know what? Let's capture him. Let's arrest him. Let's give him to Alexander, Correct. right? Because if we do this, this battle's over. The, the conflict's over. We'll live under Alexander the Great. It's better than what's happening right now. Kind of karma against Bessus because he did it to Darius, and now his own people are doing it to him. Correct. Yep. So what happens is Bessus was captured by some of the officers and handed off to Alexander the Great. The Macedonians allowed Bessus to be punished in Persian tradition. So what they did was they cut his nose and ears off and sent him off to be executed, which the execution was supervised by Darius III's own brother. That's And that's gruesome. I mean, you, I mean, you imagine. And this is... When you look, compare all these forms of these methods of torture to today, yeah. today's standards, I mean, that's just gruesome. Yeah. And look, like, isn't that, isn't that how interesting how that comes back at him, right? The man who supervised the execution is the guy's brother that, you know, the guy's, uh, the guy he kills brother, right? Correct. Like, it, 
Karma, yeah. It's complete karma. And Alexander made an effort to avenge this long-fought enemy. That and as well as, you know, kill off the threat that is saying that he's the new king. Right? I don't want anybody to claim that he's the king. I'm the king. Right. I defeated Darius. I took the Persian Empire. I have Persepolis, which he burns down, right? Yes. Was it Persepolis? Yeah. So yes, what happened correct. there? Yeah. So basically the whole idea of Persepolis was, now he's having issues here now. The deeper and deeper he goes into the Persian Empire the more Persianized he becomes. Yes. This is the issue now. The, the problem with this is that's not the ethnic makeup of his army. And they don't like this. Yeah. They don't like this. And this is when you begin to see his men mutinizing against him. Yeah. And, re- and remember, this comes full circle from what Aristotle told him in that letter. You know, don't kill off the Persian men after you take them. Because, you know, he took them. He's the king or he's the ruler. He took the Persian Empire. And he's not going to kill them all off. He's going to be win them with kindness, win their loyalty, like Aristotle told them. So his way of doing it is, I'm going to dress like a Persian man. I'm going to take part of their culture. I'm also going to mix a bit of Greek, right? I'm going to do all this stuff, the Hellenization. Co- uh, correct. Yeah. And it's difficult for him to do this because now it's a political move now. He has to face... He has to... The people that he just conquered and just destroyed in battle, he has to win their favor. How else to do that than to basically... Be one of them. Yeah, essentially become one of them. And now he has obviously the problem with that is how does he face his Macedonian soldiers after doing that? Which is the thing he did not see. He didn't see this coming. Now, it's very difficult in this situation because you've seen this happening in many times in history with other rulers. But Alexander specifically, he has to find a strategy now where he can, how he can basically apply, basically make everybody happy. Yeah. And he ends up bringing Persians even within his own army now to almost level the playing field out, if you would, yes. culturally. Yes, and uh, this conflict with his him and his own men carry on for a, a few years. Uh, so, you know, they're not happy with this, right? They're not trying to be Persian. They're not trying to marry Persian women. They're not trying to, t- you know, live here. Like He even tries to, even his closest advisors, he even tries to marry them off into Persian women. Yeah, royalty, like uh, the noblemen and stuff like that, uh, noblemen's daughters, and... Obviously, it's winning the Persians' favor. Correct. But it's not winning his own men's favor. His he, own fighting. He's losing machine. his own men, right? Which he he probably thought at that time, like, I have their loyalty, right? They would understand what I'm doing. Correct. But they didn't, which is interesting. Because you have to also remember, like, a lot of these guys are from the older generation. A lot of these guys fought under Philip II. A lot of these guys are the veterans, yeah. They're the veterans. They're not these new guys, young guys coming up. Right, maybe the younger uh, generation would understand what Alexander is trying to do, but the older guys who are used to the old, accustomed Macedonian tradition, they don't want any part of this. And this is the bulk of this is these are his top fighters, were yeah. these veterans. So if you can't, if if you're losing their favor, that's not yeah, good. We're talking about Parmenian, his second in command. We're talking about Cletus the Black. We're talking about many, many different people under him that they fought under Philip II. second. They were used to that. They're not used to this new way, right? So they're losing. Like losing favor of Alexander at this point, even questioning him, and uh, you'll see soon after. Uh, I believe this is where him his conflict with uh, Cleus the Black takes place. Correct. Right. So, okay. So what? Firstly, what happens with Persepolis? Yeah, he con- he basically conquers Persepolis, and- which is the capital of Persia. Correct. And yeah. this basically, at this point, basically crowns him as the king, the the new Persian king. So. After this, after he takes over Persepolis, he his next move from there is to go is to dive into into Bactria, yeah, Afghanistan, places like that. Yeah. Now Afghanistan's a, if you look at the the terrain of Afghanistan, it's a very very difficult place to invade because it's landlocked. It's very difficult to invade this, these types of places. Yeah. Many countries have tried, and many have failed, and there were those who have succeeded as well. But nonetheless, it was extremely difficult, regardless whether success or failure. Yeah. So. There's a, another another very important battle. It's actually a very funny battle. I think it's funny. It's uh, it's called the Battle of Sogdian Rock. Okay, so this is um, is this before he marries the Persian uh the Bactrian uh wife? Yes, this is before. Yes, okay. if I'm not wrong, this is before. Okay, so I the timeline between hi- the conflict with Cletus the Black is this before or after? This I think Cletus. It's is, around that time. It's around the same. Yeah, it is around that time. Yeah. yeah. So let me, let me get into that before we get into the battle, right? Because then after it gets right into his whole marriage, which is a big thing, you know, of his legacy. So the whole thing about you know his people, his own Macedonians, they're kind of uh they're kind of against what he's doing, right? And Cletus the Black is one of them. So Cletus the Black, remember, is the man who saved him and the empire at the Battle of Granicus. He's the one that cut off that Persian noble's arm and saved 
Alexander. He was the one who made the rest of the future events possible. Possible. He's the man that did all this, right? Correct. He's the commander of the, the Companion Cavalry. He is a very prominent general under Alexander the Great and also under Philip II. He's very highly respected at this point. And they get into a, a, a drunk quarrel. Correct. Right? They get into a drunk quarrel. And you've seen Alexander really, like, he's really getting into this, right? Into, the, like, this culture. And he's really getting into, like, you know, uh, losing himself in a way, right? Losing who he was. And uh, Cletus the Black says certain things to Alexander that is um, disputed among historians. There's different things that people said that he told Alexander that set him off, right? Some are saying that he told Alexander, you'll, you're not the true king of Macedon. Philip II still is, right? You'll never be like your father, right? He said there's different accounts of that. There's some saying that he told him that I saved you. Remember that. Don't ever forget that I saved you. You're never going to be this god that you think you are, right? There's many different... Uh, quotes and accounts of what Cletus told him, but whatever he told him set him off. And Alexander literally killed Cletus the Black through a spear through his chest, killing him. And it's one of the only deaths at the hands of Alexander that he truly regretted. Right? He it said that he grieved so badly that he even turned the spear on himself. I mean, it's one of his top generals, one of his top commanders. It's man, a man who saved his life. Man who saved his life, undoubtedly. Like, there's no debate on that. He did. And Alexander knew that, and he just killed him in a drunken rage. It's, it's insane how that all comes to that. He kills one of his commanders, and it won't be the only one. Yeah, it won't be the last one. won't be the last one. And I really wonder, I didn't see any, like, perspectives on this. Like, what did his men think about that? You know, like, what did his men think about he just killed Cletus the Black? That is insane, you know? It's very interesting because it's you see in that specific little outbreak with Cletus and Alexander, you see... Cletus attacking his pride and his ego. Yeah. And you're not seeing a very strategic side of Alexander here. He lets the rage get the best of him. Yeah. Then he makes a move he forever regrets. Forever regrets. And that's where we get into the Battle of Sogdia. The Battle of Sogdia and Rock. Now, yeah. this battle is a very interesting battle because it's, there's a, it, there's a, it's, in a way, in a way, it's kind of comedic. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 fa the, the fortress at Sogdia and Rock, basically, it's almost impenetrable. It's super high up on a steep mountain. It's very, very, very hard to get. So Alexander's, basically, he recruits 300 professional, at the time, professional rock climbers of that region. No way. The people at Sogdian Rock at that fortress, they were convinced. There is no way this guy's going to get to us. Impossible. Not a chance. Nowhere. He just can't touch us. There's no way. We're too high up. The mountain is too steep. If he swings around, we'll drop boulders projectiles he's dead game over they are 100 percent convinced there's no way alexander could come up this hill or this mountain so alexander recruits these 300 at the time that you would consider i guess prof professional rock climbers not soldiers are they soldiers no but they they act as his soldiers okay so they 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 climb up through the middle of the night up sogdian rock and I think about 83 of them die out of 300, if I'm not wrong. 80, 80 to 100. Okay. So roughly around 200 is still alive. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of the night, the people inside the fortress look up and they see a couple hundred guys that look like they're dressed as Alexander's men. And they immediately surrender the whole entire fortress. Just off the fact that they got up there. They were so scared that they surrendered the whole fortress, apparently. from They believed that, the whole, they believed that Alexander's army was up there. Oh, okay. But it was only just those 200 guys. And they were convinced it could never happen. They, they were convinced. They were 100% convinced there was no way. So they gave up. They, they literally gave up the fight without even really fighting. Whoa, that's interesting. And it was just rock climbers. Bunch of, very yeah. And, and they believed they were acting as Alexander's troops, yeah. obviously. But they believed Alexander's right above us. We can't. We're going to get rained upon. We're going to get hit with volley of arrows and, and, and siege weapons and rocks and bolts. We're going to... And he has a reputation about and he it. Was, and he had, he had really had no way of going up there. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, that's the comedic part of it. He defeated him without actually being there. <laughs> so, again, the, the tactical brilliance of Alexander. Yeah, Alexander the Great. It was kind of like intimidation. He kind of knew what they were worrying and about. And this tells you he's a master of psychological warfare. Absolutely. Master of it. Yeah, and this is um, in uh, Sogdian Rock is in which place? It's in Bactria. Bactria? Yeah, in modern day, around modern day Afghanistan. And is that where... He kind of takes that over, right? Yes. He oh, yes. takes back to it. And then that's where he gets his first marriage. Finally, right? Yes. So remember, his men were like telling him way before when he was like 21 years old, when you're going to get married. 
And at 20, around 27-ish, he gets married, but not to a Macedonian, which angered a lot of his people. Correct. Right? They expected a Macedonian queen, not a Bactrian queen, not a, you know, a different ethnicity. Correct. Which was a big thing back then. Uh, so he marries this woman named Roxana or Roxanne, whatever you want to call her. And uh, she's the daughter of the Persian noble Oxyartus, right? Oxyartus is a man who was resisting and fighting against Alexander during the time. He's also thought to have something to do with capturing Bessus, right? That rebel. Uh, maybe something about capturing him and giving him up to uh, Alexander. But Oxyartus actually surrendered. He surrendered after hearing that Alexander was treating his daughter well, right? So Alexander marries his daughter, treating her well, just like a lot of the people in this area that, you know, he's, he's grown this reputation after... You know, maybe advice from Aristotle and, you know, changing his mind about, you know, instead of slaughtering all of them and enslaving them, let me just like, you know, let me treat them well. Uh, I'll gain their favor. And he gained the favor of Oxyartus, who is one of the nobles. Um, but again, marrying Roxana was opposed by all of his men, or at least a lot of them. Correct. And, um, you know, they didn't want that Persian uh, Persian queen. Their motive, uh, the motive for this marriage could be many different things. Right. It could be political reasons, which is what I believe, obviously. Um, I think he was using this so that the Sogdian army would be loyal to Alexander. Yeah, it was political leverage. Yeah. You know, if I'm going to marry a noble woman, the, the army's going to really listen to me. You know, I'm the, I'm going to, they're going to be loyal to me. They're going to listen to what I say and, you know, not cause any headaches when I expand my conquests. When I'm out of here, they're going to be still be, still be loyal to me. You know what I'm saying? So this seems to be a bit of his mentality going into it. Uh, so it also shows his tactical mindset, not only on the battlefield, but out of it. And this is the very interesting thing that now that you mentioned that. What's very interesting about that, and there's a, there's a very old saying by, by a man, Carl von Clausewitz. He once said, war is a continuation of politics by other means. And this is very interesting because you're seeing a very political side of Alexander to further his military campaigns. Pure genius. Yeah, absolutely. And that man, Oxyartus, his uh, wife's father, he actually promotes him to uh, as a governor of the region of Hindu Kush, right? Hindu Kush is that mountain region. You know, it's like expanding from Pakistan uh, to Uzbekistan, you know, Afghanistan's around that region, right? Uh, that's the region that now Oxyartus is going to be governor over. And um, from there, he marches to India, right? Correct. Marches to India, so he didn't spend too much time. Uh, he married the woman, and he's moving on. Right now, the interesting part about his entrance into India now, his men initially were not really for this. India is a very was a very different world compared to the Persians he fought against, the Greeks, and all the other Balkan opponents that he had. Mm -hmm. This is a very different fight, and at this time, a lot of people in in the in the west and specifically in the balkans in europe they believed that india was the was the the last country of the world meaning there was no other countries beyond that yeah so if he conquers india he conquered the world he basically in his mind he conquered the world they didn't they didn't know about anything else they didn't know about china they didn't know about these other places so to him india this was the final campaign and there was a lot more <laughs> oh there was much more yeah and he would have found out if he went that far yeah for sure and the interesting thing about India is now they're using their ways of waging war are very different. They're from the swords, the spears, methods, tactic, everything. It's all very, very different. You're seeing swords, the type of swords, for example, they had a whip sword that had nine blades. It's, it has the shape, nine blades that are shaped just like a whip. And it easily can sever arms and legs, easily. And you're talking bows that were six seven even up to eight feet long that they would plant into the ground and just shoot and with tremendous power easily go through any kind of armor at that specific time and elephants war elephants huge huge the indians were very big on using war elephants they was this like the earliest signs of or earliest uh usage of elephants yes uh elephants or, yes or it was like really it was before hannibal even you know yes. hannibal was known for this yes hannibal yeah this is bef this is using elephants before this is very early usage of elephants yeah. for sure and the interesting thing is now we move into the northwestern north indian empire remember india's fractured into 16 different kingdoms at this time that's a whoa 16 yes and where alexander invades that empire that specific kingdom is called the nanda empire northwestern india and the ruler of the specific region at the Hadaspis River that he fights at, the famed Hadaspis River everybody knows about, mm -hmm. the king there is King Porus. And he's he's a very proud man. He's a very, he's as in Greek historians describe him as a very proud man. And 
Interestingly enough, when Alexander gets the gets by the Hadaspus River, once he marches his men towards that area, it rains. It's very rainy. It's very you know, thunderstorms. It's yeah. very bad conditions. Yeah. And the thing about this is, what's interesting about this battle is now is Porus is watching Alexander across the river. He's watching every move he's making. He's like, all right, what is this guy doing? Every move he makes, keep an eye on him. Cut him off. He wants to move right. He wants to move left. Cut him off. He wants to move right. Cut him off. There's no fighting going on yet. Alexander's just scanning the whole area. Where are the weaknesses? Where can I attack? When can I attack? Where's the openings? Alexander's looking up and down, up and down the shoreline, up by the river. Mm-hmm. And Porus is just, just carefully watching him. So what happens from here now, in the middle of the night, Alexander throws he, his men, he sends his men really far up the river, under Porus's radar. Porus doesn't know this is going on. So now Alexander and his men are go up further north. I'm not sure how many miles it might have been, but they were they, they went really far north to where Porus couldn't see them. So Porus thinks that, you know, he's camped across the river. I can see him. I'm good. Mm-hmm. Porus has no idea that Alexander, he took a contingent and went across the river further north. So now Alexander has to signal his men somehow that let them know when they can attack. And just before all that happens, the attack, he has to cross this river with a small contingent. It's very hard. It's very dark outside. It's raining very hard. Thunderstorms. It's it's just horrible conditions yeah. to march. And it's very, and usually under wet conditions is when char- uh, soldiers undergo infections and disease. It's, it's rough. It's, especially with armor and weapons on you. You're, you're very heavy. It makes it difficult. Yeah. It, it makes it very difficult. And this, and this it could cause a wear and tear on a soldier's mentality. But Alexander, of course, with seemingly endless determination yeah he crosses the river successfully very difficult march because he had to make makeshift bridges and everything it was very difficult yeah so as he crosses the river he he sends a signal out to his main army that's right across from porus to go for the attack so they go for the attack porus is ready yes i think port now alexander's numbers are between 40 and forty-five thousand around there mm-hmm. porus measures anywhere between 50 and fifty-five thousand. so Porus has, I think, about if I'm not wrong, he's he has thousands of war elephants. If I'm not wrong, he's got that's a lot. He has a lot of war elephants. Now, now elephants are, as we've mentioned in the last episode, elephants are are a huge psychological. You see, I mean, when you see an elephant coming at you, it's extremely terrifying. They can easily break the ranks of enemy infantry oh, very easily. And just a few of them. If if especially if your enemy doesn't know how to deal with them. So now, eventually, they did. The elephants did pose a problem for the Macedonian infantry in the beginning. It did. But the Macedonians figured out the weak point. They would stab, you know, they would stab the elephants in the eyes, and that would cause a panic. Now, when, it, when an elephant panics, it goes the other way. It could turn right against. Now them. the shock factor yeah. backfires. So what happens here is now there's a hard infantry fight going on. Alexander sweeps in from the flank, and then Porus is taken completely by surprise. Has no idea. So eventually, Porus is defeated. I believe he loses about twenty five thousand, anywhere between twenty and twenty five thousand men. Alexander's numbers are much smaller, but accounts aren't really that accurate. Though. Yeah, they're all over the place. So, and this is a very interesting encounter. Now you see Porus. Now Porus has a face to face encounter with Alexander after the battle. Alexander, he says, basically, Porus they describe him as a man that's well over six feet. Alexander, of course, they number him at five ten, five eleven, and they have this. Back and forth, basically, Alexander, you know, I am the king, this and that, basically, basically boasting. Yeah. And Porus still holds his ground and says, I am a king, I will not be subservient to anybody. And Alexander doesn't kill him. Alexander doesn't execute him. Alexander actually respects him and actually views him and appreciates the warrior spirit that Porus is perceiving or that he's showing to Alexander. It's a very interesting encounter between the two. And, of course, nonetheless, the battle was a very huge victory for Alexander. Yeah, and it's interesting how, um, you know, he saw that or he heard that remark or that response. And he's like, okay, you know, not bad. You know what I'm saying? Normally, you would expect, but see, they say that poor set of it was a very proud man. Yeah. He was a very, very, very full of pride. So, he was after the, so he wins the Battle of Hedaspus River. Correct. At this point, mm-hmm. which is one of his biggest battles. Correct. Right. It really set him forward in India, right? Was this uh, the biggest battle in India, I believe, right? This was his biggest, yeah, this was his biggest battle in India. He has another one right after this. It's in the, the siege. Of, it's it's called the Malian Campaign. Okay. And, but the, just before that, I, I want to mention that the Macedonians, you know, hats off to the Macedonians in this respect because they're so far away from home. They're fighting really hard against an unknown enemy. They, they're, I mean, you're talking Macedonia's all the way in Europe, India's all the way deep into South Asia. This is very, this is a very far journey. And Alexander, with his 
endless determination. He truly was a an incredible, incredible conqueror and a general. I mean, he was very intelligent. He was. Yeah. But after they had Aspis River, he his men don't want to do this anymore. His men are saying, we, we've got to go back home. We are so far out. Yeah, by this time, it's what? Ten years almost. About? Yeah, I think the year I believe right now is about three twenty, anywhere between three twenty six and three twenty four BC. Yeah. So yeah, because Hadassus River was three twenty six, correct, and then uh, three twenty four is where he marries the the two other women. So what happens here after Hadassus? Now, now they're they're basically on their way out. Now the men don't want to do this anymore. The men are saying we're tired. We can't keep doing this. We need to leave. So he on his way out he comes across the city called the sea it's called the siege of Malton. This is a very important battle because you see another in a way another heroic story. You're seeing another heroic story of Alexander the Great. So basically the story goes like this. Maybe siege the city of Malton. Alexander himself actually climbs one of the siege ladders to climb up the wall. And this is now we don't know how historically historically accurate this is. It could be just like a glorification of Sure, him. it could just be glorifying him. Yeah. But they say he climbs up the the castle wall, mm-hmm. and as he lands, once he gets on his feet on top of the wall, the Indian soldiers are con- are in complete awe. They're just like, "This is him, this is Alexander the Great." Yeah, this the is king. the this is the man right in front of us. And in this battle, this is where Alexander suffers a almost life threatening injury. He's hit from an arrow in the chest that barely, they say, barely pierces his lung, and. It puts them out of commission for the rest of the fight. And they say the Macedonian soldiers were so angered that they just slaughtered so many people inside the city. They, they ended up, did winning that battle, but through complete slaughter. And it was it was a bloody kill. Yeah, yeah. And it was just to show, like, the loyalty the men still had from, even though they were kind of like, uh, you know, growing tired. Sure, yeah. Of all were, of it. They grew tired, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're on foot for well, over 10 years, at the, maybe around 10 years at this point. And um, after that, do they return back? Do they start to go back or do they stay in India? Actually, yes, they do return back. But before they return back further west, Alexander had thought about continuing his campaign in India. But once he had went deeper, he sent scouts and intelligence agents deeper into, you know, the northwestern Indian territories. And they had saw cities guarded by hundreds of thousands of soldiers and just people in general. And they said, his men are like, we do not we do not have the supplies, the manpower, just even, it, we need to go back. This this is too much at this point. Yeah. So eventually he leaves India, heads back into Saudi Arabia, modern day Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, I think that's where, um, he. I think he lands at the Susa at some point, right? Susa around, oh, like close to Babylon. That's, I think, where he, I believe that's where he married the two women. So... He gets into two different marriages. So he he's still married to uh, Roxana. So what he does at this point, he's like around 30 years old. He promotes Roxana, his wife's brother, to an elite cavalry. So he can strengthen his ties with, uh, you know, the Bactrians and the Persians. Uh, and he also marries this woman named Statera II, who was the, the allegedly Darius III's daughter. And he also married, at this at around the same time, Perisatis II, who was the youngest daughter of the king of the... Achaemenid Empire. Artaxerxes? Artaxerxes. Man, these names are something. Yeah, they're difficult to pronounce. Artaxerxes III. It is believed that Roxana was, you know, understandably jealous of all this, right? He's marrying multiple women at the same time. He's doing it for political gain, of course, right? But it also, it it brings like this power struggle that later comes to fruition. Um, You know, if you have different wives, you have different kids. Who's going to take the heir? You know, there's a lot of different things here. Yeah, there's a power struggle. There's a power struggle that he might not actually be thinking too far in the future about, right? Yeah, he was very much like his father in this respect, that he had a very military mindset. And his father didn't really look at things from that perspective either. And he he very much took, in a way, took after his father with that. Yeah. You know, this goes into a lot of different, like, political struggles later. Um, Not only with that, but then his wife gets involved in certain things. This is all after, you know, all that happens after uh, Alexander's death. So he marries the two other women that's going to come into fruition later. And then what happens right after that? This is like bef- not too far off before he dies. Yeah. So now he, he his death is in 323. Yeah. So right here now he's planning to campaign to conquer Arabia because to him that's the next goal now. That's yeah. conquer Arabia. He obviously, like I said, his men had already mutinied against him. And then he started having complications with health issues and things like that. And then it, it, it just became very difficult at this point. And then, then I think... A lot of people began to see now the downfall of Alexander. Okay, you're you're basically done now. You can't just keep going and going and conquering and fighting and fighting. There there needs to come an end to this, and he eventually falls ill. 
Yeah. <laughs> It, now it's it, there's I mean it's suspect yeah. how he died. Some people say he was poisoned. Some people say he honestly died from illness. It's suspect. It, it's one of the biggest mysteries you know in the world because if he didn't die, he would have continued. Oh surely, yeah. At thirty two years of thirty, he was still young. That's still very young. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even though life expectancy was short back then, but you know at his age he was still capable of continuing. I mean, oh, he, he was. Yeah, he was definitely capable. Some of his com- commanders were more powerful than he was, and. um what came uh, before this, before his death, was another murder of another one of his commanders, right? Parmenian. Correct. Yeah, Parmenian. Yep. Parmenian. Remember, Parmenian is the second in command. He's been with Alexander this whole time, and he's also was with Philip II. Right. He was the most trusted man, or well, Hephaestion right, was actually like probably the most trusted, or it was arguably between them two, uh, as Hephaestion was Alexander's best friend who died, and Alexander was in deep grief when that happened. What happens is Parmenian's son conspires against Alexander and Alexander gets him executed, right? He still keeps that hand strong about like, you know, if you call, you go against me, my own men, if you go against me, you will be executed. But then why did this lead to Parmenian dying? Well, it was just straight up about paranoia. It was all, that's all it was at that point. Yeah, he believed he might have gotten, come to get revenge on him. Yeah, for he killing believed, his son. yeah, Parmenian didn't do anything. There was no evidence he conspired. He worked with his son in this. He, he did anything about it. And, you know, obviously Parmenian knows that his son was executed. But then Alexander orders the execution of Parmenian. But then he kind of regretted that because he was like, okay, wait, why would I order that? I should have him just killed. Why would I tell Parmenian he's going to be executed? Parmenian is not only a, uh, obviously a strong warrior himself, but he has a lot of respect among his uh, peers, among the different men in the army, among the, the people as well. Correct. And a lot of people know of Parmenian. He's a second in command. He's more experienced than even Alexander the Great is. Sure. So Alexander, what he did was uh, he sent two men on camels to ride through the desert and kill Parmenian before he gets word of his execution. He did this so Parmenian would never have any kind of retaliation or any kind of reaction to these news, you know, to the news of him getting executed. So he had him killed right away before he killed Cletus the Black, and now he killed Parmenian, two of some of his best generals under him. He just murdered both of them. One of them was out of drunken rage, and this one's out of paranoia, right? He was extremely paranoid about this one. It, it really goes into what you were saying, like, it shows like this downfall of Alexander. Yeah, you're seeing the, this this decline, this rhythm of decline of Alexander. Now he had his glory, he had his the, his victories. Now it's the downfall. You get rid of Parmenian. You get now it's just it's just madness at this point. Complete madness. He dies, right? So there's a lot of conspiracy, right? The, they say the yellow fever killed him. Uh, some say he was poisoned, right? There's many people that potentially could have killed him, right? They say his men may have killed him to stop this conquest. Right, because obviously they were very tired of it. There was no end to it. So you know, maybe his men did it. Maybe his wife did it, Roxana, because of his other marriages. Right? Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that Roxana wanted his son or her son to take the spot right away. Maybe it could have been Aristotle. Now, why couldn't it have been Aristotle? Well, Alexander actually executed Aristotle's nephew. So there could have been reason for that. I don't believe that one because Aristotle doesn't seem that kind of like that kind of guy. But um, th- there's many different conspiracies as to how and why Alexander got killed at 32 years old. And the interesting thing about this is, is you're seeing Alexander's making a lot of unnecessary enemies at this point. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. As, as a military mind, you, you, have to, you have to very logically, but even at times, be very cold as a military mind, as a, the mind of a general. You have to be understand that don't make wars that are not planned for. Yeah. Don't fight even if it's non even if it's not military, even if it's political or just relationship wise, you can't start wars that you didn't plan for. And killing Parmenian, having issues with Aristotle's you know, it's it's not th- these are unnecessary. They're completely this, unnecessary. And this is what's going to eventually cause mutiny because they're going to lose faith. His men are eventually going to lose faith in his leadership. Yes. And uh this conflict, this whole dispute carries on even after he dies. Right, with his men. So what happens after he dies is um, there needs to be an heir to the throne, right? Someone needs to take over. There's no king. And Roxana, his first wife, is pregnant. So she's pregnant at the time. They don't know if it's going to be a son. If it's a son, it's the new king. If it's a daughter, there is no king. So they don't know what to do at this point. They can't just like gamble, oh, maybe it's a son, maybe it isn't. 
you know? Yeah, you can't just do a coin flip on this. You first. can't do a coin flip on that. You know, you got to really be sure here because the men need a leader. They yeah, need and, someone here. They're not even home. And a capable leader at that. They're not even home at this point. No, yeah, they're, they're in the east. They're in the east. They're far away from home right now. And they need someone to lead them back. Someone who's experienced. Someone, you know, so different figures, different commanders have uh, stepped forward and proposed different ideas here. There's two generals. So there's Perdiccas. Perdiccas is, you know, he's fought through many of these battles. Uh, Perdiccas has been there for a pretty long time at this point. And there's another general named Maligar, right? These were the two heads of opposing political parties where Perdiccas wanted to wait until the birth of Alexander's son. But Maligar proposed Alexander's mentally disabled half-brother, Arihadius, or Alexander's illegitimate son, Heracles, to be king instead of waiting to see if Roxana was going to have a son. So why wait? Like, this is kind of his thing. Like, why, why are we waiting for, you know, something that may not even happen? Right? Let's just designate someone who makes sense at this point. But there's other reasons behind what Maligar was saying. It's also thought that Maligar wanted a true, full-blooded Macedonian to be king. Because Alexander's son is not going to be full-blooded Macedonian. Correct. He's, he's going to be half Bactrian. Perdiccas, at this point, was designated to be the, re- uh, the regent of the empire. The regent of the empire is practically like the king before the one is crowned. Like, he's going to take that spot until the rightful king comes up, right? Correct. So, Perdiccas has the power. So, it could also be that Maligar didn't want Perdiccas to have that power. It could be like a jealousy a jealousy uh, reason. And we also do know that Maligar showed his jealousy in the past when Alexander, at one point, uh, traveled to bring a gift or sent out a gift to one of the Indian kings, right? But he never really gave a gift to Maligar. Well, who was one of his men who was there for a very long time, and he, he felt a little bit jealous. And even Alexander told him, like, jealous will kill you one day. Correct. Yeah. Right, jealousy will kill you one day. And it, you're starting to see a little bit more of that as well. And yeah, and I also believe that, like, Perdiccas, you know, being the ultimate authority, he kind of wants the power as well. You do see an act that he goes through. He kind of, like, plays it up a little bit. So what happens here is there's extreme violence, right? Maligar, Maligar's uh, actions were so extreme at this point uh, extreme at this point to make uh, Alexander's half brother the king, that he banded the infantry with him, right? So he banded the infantry and ordered the execution of Perdiccas. Extreme action from a, a dispute about who's going to be the king. Yeah, that's that's taking it to the very extreme, right? And yeah. it really it really questions like what his motive is here, right? Correct. Like what really is it really about? who the king's, uh, you know, what the ethnicity of the king is going to be. You're seeing a lot of these people show their true colors now. And, and, and this is when true colors get shown is during a power vacuum, as they call it. During yeah. a power struggle when there's, who's going to be the top guy now? Who's going to be the lead? Who's going to take reign? Who's going to... Exactly. Now you're seeing where true colors come out. Yeah. And he, he, he's banning the infantry, you know, to get behind them, which he did. But this uh, order of execution failed because Perdiccas, I mean, although Perdiccas is known to not get along with some of the other generals... Um, but they never discredited or questioned his status and achievements, right? Perdiccas has been there. He's done a lot of great things throughout his, through the, uh, throughout this whole conquest. And most of the warriors saw Perdiccas as probably the most capable of leading at this point. Um, th- all, there's different generals that were, uh, you know, they traveled to different places at this point, And Perdiccas is the one right there at that time in that place that can lead them. And there's also a story that, Alexander on his deathbed gave Perdiccas a ring for promotion. I don't know if this is true. And then Perdiccas showed or displayed the ring when they were having this uh, political dispute. And um, at this point, Perdiccas was backed by pretty much, pretty much every general or nearly every general and much of the cavalry as well. So the cavalry and the generals are behind Perdiccas. They're not taking the leaguer side. Correct. And that pretty much stops it there, you know. It's going to be tough for Maligar to really convince anybody at this point. But then another one of, one of actually Alexander's greatest generals, greatest minds under his army, uh, uh, hard to pronounce his name as well, Uraminus, right? Uraminus or something like that. Yeah, it's difficult to pronounce. Yeah. Uh, well, he helped to compromise, right? He helped to find a compromise between these two where he said we should make both Alexander's half-brother and Roxana's unborn son to take the crown both, like, together. And also make both Maligar and Perdiccas uh, work as the region of the empire together. Interesting. Interesting, right? Of course that didn't last long. No, no, of course not. No, they were too much, they were too much at odds with each other at that point. And it shows you, I think it was more about the power struggle, let alone, you know, not, not really, like, 
who the king was going to be, right? Uh, so this didn't last long. Perdiccas actually deceived Meleager. So what uh, per uh, Perdiccas did was he got close with Alexander's half-brother. Right, he got close, he got in his ear, he became like some kind of master or teacher to him during this time. Master manipulator in that sense, yeah. Yep, and remember, uh, Alexander's half-brother is intellectually disabled, right? Correct. So it's going to be quite easier for someone like Perdiccas to get to him. Um, whereas Maligar didn't really, it seemed like, didn't even really try to do this. Uh, so during a general review where they all gathered, Perdiccas was able to instigate Alexander's half-brother to capture and execute about 300 of the infantry, and later Maligar himself, after Maligar fled into sanctuary. This gave Perdiccas pretty much the most capable power in the empire at the time. Even after Alexander's son was born, so Alexander did have a son. Even after that son was born, Perdiccas is really like, he's the one with the most of the power at that point, right? Because he's still the regent. Like, uh, he's still the guy that has the most intellectual capabilities of leading the empire. Correct. Or leading the men, at least. Um, you know, the son was too young to lead and the half-brother was mentally incapable. So, Mali and Maligar was just executed. Perdiccas is the regent and the highest order general there at the time. And what's interesting about this also is, then Roxana comes into this. So, Alexander's wife got the blessings from Perdiccas, allegedly, to kill Alexander's other wives. Yeah, you're seeing a massive power struggle here. Complete power struggle, backstabbing, all this stuff is just going on behind the scenes all after the, Alexander's death. Oh, yeah, all the lowest tactics being used just to gain some power. So remember that the, the wife of uh, Alexander, the one that's the daughter of Darius III, it's alleged that Roxana po had her poisoned and thrown down a well with her sister. Now, there's other accounts that dispute this and say there's no reason the sister would be killed. And the actual person that was killed along with uh, Alexander's uh, second wife is his third wife. Because that's a way for Roxana to take away any kind of power struggle later down the road. She wants her uh, her son to become the king. And her to be also powerful at this time. It's actually, you're starting to see uh, maybe a little bit of a similarity between her and Philip's wife. You know, Alexander's mother. Olympias, yeah. Yeah, Olympias. And... That pretty much, like, settled, I mean, at that point after Alexander, I'm, I believe the empire didn't really last that long, right? No, it it, it instantly uh, fractured, uh, fractured, uh, fractured into uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty ruled by Ptolemy, one of his generals, and the Seleucids, and then these people eventually came into contact with the Romans, which they were eventually all taken over. So, and then in the other eastern half that was in by Persepolis and areas like that was swallowed in by future Persian empires after that. Yeah, so, yeah, th these. It was just a large struggle for power. They when they were eventually all taken over by much bigger and stronger empires much later on. Yeah, and it also shows you. Uh, remember when we? It, it brings it back full circle when we're talking about the lions and the sheep, right? They lost their lion as their head. Correct. Once Alexander kicked the bucket, that was it. It was it. They that couldn't do. It. And the army's still powerful. And, and the interesting thing about this is, is you, you're seeing how fast Alexander built himself and his empire and his kingdom, his army, and everything. And then how fast it died out. Very quickly. Super fast. It's almost like uh, you rise as you fall, right? Yeah. Happened, he rose very quickly and it all fell very quickly. And, you know, he's regarded as like the, the greatest warrior general, conqueror in all history after all of this. And as you can see, there's a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot of betrayal. There's a lot of po political struggle. He wasn't as noble as led to believe. He's not as honorable as he's led to believe. A lot of different things about Alexander the Great was very romanticized, very glorified. You know, actually, so compared to actual reality. Yeah, he was definitely just as paranoid, as ruthless, as brutal, as he was heroic and generous. Yes. So it's, there's two sides, there's, there's two faces there. You're not just seeing that. And I understand, you know, everybody looks at Alexander, oh, you know, the great, the heroic. Well, there's a darker side to him too. There's a very dark side to him too. It's not just super heroic, you know, great guy. There's, there's, there's definitely brutality behind that. Yeah, of course. And it's, uh. It's very interesting, you know, because sometimes I take the side of the modern historians when we're talking about Alexander the Great, and obviously there's a lot to this guy. We could we could make you know multiple episodes, you know, many more episodes on Alexander the Great, even like specific battles and stuff like that. Um, but you just really wonder how much of it is accurate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, you, you know what the interesting thing is about 
when you're looking at Greek accounts, you have to be uh, very careful because as somebody who spread Hellenization to, to the level that he did, yeah. according to the Greeks, there is, there will be a lot of over over glorification, of course. So you have to be very careful about how you absorb the information that you're reading. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's going to be the end of the podcast um, on YouTube. If you guys want to catch the rest of it on Patreon, uh, we're going to get into a lot more stuff as well. More opinions, more of our takes about, you know, what Alexander was about and what he did and where we kind of like rank him in terms of like uh, all of his accomplishments and stuff like that. So we can see you on the Patreon. Sometimes you you wonder if he didn't die at 32 years old, like if he kept going. What would have happened? What would have happened? Well, think of, yeah, that's a very interesting thought. I mean, would he have conquered Arabia? Would he have conquered further into India? I mean, who knows? Could you imagine he took India over and just saw China? <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that would have been insane. <laughs> you know, like, finally I took over India. I took the world. And then you see an even bigger country. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you see China. It's like you got another giant to the east. Who were they at the time? Now, the China, China was going under the Warring States period. There was oh, a bunch okay. of different kingdoms. Which they, that happens so many times throughout their history. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Warring, you had the Spring and Autumn period, which lasted like, you know, three, four hundred years. And the Warring States would last another three, four hundred years. You're talking almost a whole millennia of just constant yeah, exactly. warfare. Like, could you just be, could you imagine being one of those soldiers? Like, you finally, because India was going to be a problem, like a very tough fight. Oh, that would have been a huge problem for him. Yeah. Huge, huge problem. And then let's say he gets through India and it's like, oh, shoot. There's China too, and then there's other countries. We got Africa on the other side. I, like, I personally don't know how he would have taken that though. The whole I, thing I don't with, know either. The India, I mean, that's a huge. I mean, that's 